exhibition soon in the same space, um, which will uh, feature basketry from the Bask, uh, the, sorry, the Basha family collection of um, basketry. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce Jared So. He was an artist that was um, participating in Arriving Forever for the Present World. Uh, Jared So is a fourth generation Diné potter who currently resides in Nahat Ahzil, Arizona. So completed his MFA in ceramics at the University of New Mexico during the fall of 2021. He has an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and has since transferred to full-time artist. This unique combination of a technical degree and passion for clay has provided a unique view to his practice. So has received multiple awards in ceramics and recognition for his innovative approach. More recently, So was featured as one of the Dwell 24, a group of rising stars in the world of design, as well as best of classification for pottery at the Heard Museum Indian Market in 2023. While focusing in traditional Diné pottery techniques, so hopes to challenge the existing boundaries that confine the conversation of native ceramics in the context of the past. Um, so I think you will enjoy hearing uh, what he has to speak about today. Um, Jared? Hi, thank you. Um, I believe, um, I'm, I don't know if I can share my um, video right now, but I have the, um, oh, perfect. Um, yeah, everyone. Jared so yinishia, Belagana Nishlo, Nakadne to Eglini Bushes Chin, Belagana Edasche, Ado Loka de Ne Dashanale, A good ego de Net Nishle, um, the Nebahish Klish, um, at Sa Ashi, um, Hikat, Hikat La. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, it great, gives pretty good context for, um, the remainder of the, um, presentation. Um, for the start of it, um, I want to start with the context for my current artist statement. Um, I broke it into three parts. Um, unfortunately, I mislabeled this first one part one or part two. It is supposed to be part one. Um, I broke it into three sections for the structure of the presentation, as well as so that this first slide isn't so text heavy. So the first section is, I often desire for my vessels to function as a form of landscape. This desire, while it contains caution, bears attachments to more than just land and scape. It is an agenda written on a billboard that points west, a westward gesture that is deeply rooted in the nostalgic memory of America and the progress and expansion that it so deeply desires. This east to west motion carries with it the tools of authenticity that act as more than just a stamp of approval, but I can feel it bind my wrists and tell me to recreate the rest world fantasy. I hear a long forgotten whistle from a train as it steams through Old Town in the name of tradition. I feel a burning hiss that signals for me to stay in my place. Um, the second part addresses um, some con some critiques I have on tradition. Um, tradition for the American Indian is a double-edged knife. One side of the knife is sharpened with community and is used, out, used to carve out what we want our future to look like. The other is marred by the anthropological and archeological definitions of the nostalgic past, where our authenticity as native peoples lies in the act of recreating the past with primitive methods. Finally, part three, to our fault, we, soften, we tend to soften the memories of our past with romance rather than fall in love with our present. I hope my work leaves a lingering taste that is reminiscent of that fleeting moment. I in intend it to carry the weight of all these events that are happening at the same time. I dream of pots that tell a story of land while also escaping, escaping the vernacular that limits its realness. So, to address the first part of my artist statement, um, I took a class in graduate school with a professor named Kirsten Buick, where we took some, uh, looked at some analysis of landscape paintings of the American West and the themes that are common of paintings of this era. 
Um, this particular painting, it's at the Art Institute of Chicago, this, um, titled Distant View of Niagara Falls by Thomas Cole. Um, there's an obvious time element set in autumn where um, this has the significance that the American Indian's time is coming to a close. Um, it's also important to see the state of the heavens and how this is organized across the canvas. From left to right, it mirrors the movement of east to west. On the right side of the canvas, it is light and bright. And the other side, the left side of the canvas is dark and stormy. So this is signifying that this is a divine process, that this expansion from east to west is um, divine. Um, it also, one theme along these paintings is American Indians are often present, not particular in this painting that they are literally in the margins, but oftentimes they are in the margins, signifying that American Indians are very much part of the landscape and part of nature, but unable to comprehend its meaning um, from how we look at landscapes and classify them as the beautiful, the sublime, and picturesque, but also the understanding um, and creating meaning of the process of how nowhere becomes somewhere. This is another painting, um, quite famous one. Um, and it, you can see this process of how somewhere be, or nowhere becomes somewhere. Of on the left side of the painting, it is dark again. You can see the start, the state of the heavens. Um, and how on the right side of the painting, there you can see the American progress, the organization of landscape um, in a way that is legible to America. It is, you can also see the tools in which that this is happening, that this process is inherently violent um, and that um, the American Indian is again in the margins, a part of the landscape, but not under uh, able to comprehend this process of progress in the form of arranging landscape. Um, so this leads me to part two. Um, tradition for the American Indian is a double-edged knife. One side is marged by the anthropological and archeological definitions of the past, where our authenticity as native peoples lies in the act of recreating the past with primitive methods. The other side of the knife is sharpened with community and, e and is used to carve out what we want our future to look like. Depending on how we use this tool, it will have real life consequences to the future, whether you are a settler or a fel fellow native person. Um, so during my MFA, while I was taking these classes, I wanted to break down some of the challenges I faced when addressing traditional versus contemporary, especially with how my work was being labeled. Um, and I used this opportunity to um, look at clay as a form of landscape, that the vessels I create are um, a form of landscape and ultimately how that can be a form of storytelling. And both landscape and storytelling are a form of memory. Um, and during this time, I was going through huge transitions in fatherhood. Um, my father passed away in 2020. Um, and at the same time, I was coming into fatherhood. So looking at this role of storyteller and landscape and memory engulfed or embodied in this kind of perspective of fatherhood was um, quite a profound time in my life, especially with my future body of work. Um, so this is a piece from my thesis show that is in response to both landscape 
as well as storytelling. It is titled Tleyet Neyane, which translates to the one that developed in the underground. Um, it is in reference to a story my father shared with me of when first man and first woman were taken into the underground with talking God. And they went into this underground area and they saw this mirror on the floor. And they're like, what is this? So talking God used his gish and pointed his at, with his staff to the ceiling and they saw a droplet form and it fell. So when it hit that mirror, it went whoop. And that's when they say water first introduced itself. So the word in Navajo for water is tw. And so this piece um, is that layer of storytelling um, of how storytelling is often around about the space around us, whether it be our relationships, our relationships with landscape or with one another. Um, and um, that's what this piece embodied alongside of, of using the stories that my father shared with me around clay as a foundation for a lot of my work. Um, this is another piece from my thesis show, um, titled Loka Tsat referencing to my fourth clan, my Nullies, which is a line that most of my pottery comes from, um, in reference to that origin story of offerings given to an eagle nest um, and children coming from that. So these are a series of round bottom vessels um, nestled in a nest like shape um, using reeds. Um, and other organic material um, like redwood to um, tell this story. This is also linked to specific places, specific landscapes. So in, um, in this story, there are specific places on the res where reservation, the Navajo reservation where this, this took place. Um, so when I talk about tradition and contemporary in most juried shows, it's broken down where tradition is dissolved or simplified to technique. Um, it's often you harvest your own clay. It's coil built, hand, uh, hand built, stone polished, fired outdoors, um, as well as no artificial additives. Contemporary side is the opposite. Commercial clay, kiln fired, wheel thrown, maybe glazes, and sometimes an exploration of form. Um, I think it's really important to look at this, that this is very much ideology, or not ideology, uh, methodology. Um, it is a shallow perspective to interpret culture. So in this next body of work from my MFA, I was grappling with this question of tradition and kind of the next steps that I'm going to take as this as a potter. Um, this is an installation with shapes of classic Navajo shapes um, that are placed almost like they're in footprints, referencing to Nakaidna Toitlini, that is who I'm born for, um, and how that part of that translation and that story footprints took place. Um, my connection to clay is one that is generational, four to be precise, four iterations of tradition and community that have created a path that I now stand on. And as I walk down this path, I have noticed milestones manifested in material, process, technique, methodology, connection, and creation. As I ponder these concepts, I have taken the time to reflect what kind of reactions would previous generations have toward the vessels I create? What critique would they give? Whether it be to my liking or not, my additions to this carved path are permanent and the answer to my question still hangs in the air. While considering what these permanent additions will be, I attempt to guide the direction with thoughts of storytelling, tradition, authenticity, stereotype, community, and livelihood. These concepts act as a reference point that be called upon to reflect on the path already taken and how to approach the path that is yet to come. I think it is important to, meant to um, give credit that the definitions in a lot of jury shows 
um, technique and methodology can be a powerful point of reference, but it should not stop at that point. We need additional elaboration. Um, and for some context, while I was making these bodies of work, um, both Leyet Neyene, Lokatsatene, and this piece, um, I want to share some readings from, or writings from my time in grad school. Um, as I sit and contemplate my pots, wondering where they will take me, I am flooded with memories. They take me back to the thought of thoughts of my late grandmother, Faith So. I think of the time spent together as it is only enhanced by the familiar scent of wet clay and spe the specific minerals making up its profile. I often wonder where her mind was while she worked with this wet material. Now as an adult, I carry more questions and would jump at the opportunity to pick her brain. What, her, what would her reactions be to um, what would her reaction be to my pots and what kind of taste would her critique leave in my mouth? These questions have consistently lingered in my mind and have always held a growing sense of craving, a craving that has only intensified with the recent passing of my father. Ironically, it has been easier to nurture my creative process, but the same cannot be said about speaking about it. Similar to how, at times, the best remedy to childhood adversity was a comforting hug from your father, the type of hug where nothing had to be said. This realization gave me a new perspective to my creative process, where the lines are blurred between where this process of making begins becomes a time for me to process my relationship with my father. I think of our time spent together with clay, how we talked and thought about the materials, eventually feeling our way through the natural world until vessels were brought into being. Together, our collective senses would influence each other toward a shared vision, unaware at the time we were exchanging recipes. And the following is a quote from a book called Eating the Landscape. What happens is that these recipes act like stories that are told and retold in different ways, depending on the storyteller, or in this case, the cook. Because they are family recipes, they are also communal. Communal storytelling has a way of correcting itself. The corrections that are not, are not seeking absolute truth, but a communal truth, close quote. I realize now at the time I shared with my father was more than just sitting around working on, a t working on pots. When we would pull over on the side of the road because we spotted clay or our collective attentiveness around pots that were engulfed, engulfed in flame, he was telling stories. These stories were of his time with his mother and the communal recipe that had once been told to him. Now, as the next generation of potter, I inherit the role of storyteller. Whether it be to my liking or not, my additions to this story are permanent a permanence that is embedded in the same clay that my family has over, always used. Jared, um, thank yes. you so much for sharing this with us. Um, I just wanted to interject here um, and let you know that I really like the arrangement of the pots and especially um, their tie or your, your, your reasoning for arranging them this way is that they resemble um, footprints. Um, can you are are each of these pots um, symbolic of a family member, or did you arrange them in a certain way um, to tell a story through each pot? Is can you walk us through that that thought process? Um, yeah, during the time um, I wanted, so this was the first project I made in graduate school, and I wanted to make classic forms as a point of reference for myself as I um, was first time going to school in the context of an artist. And so I wanted to make pots that were intended for function and use, for ceremonial use, rather than something that will have a life in a museum collection or in storage, but have a life in use, possibly passing multiple hands um, and a life beyond me there's not specific symbology for individual pots, but just in terms of um, considering shape, 
the type of necklace design, something that's simple, um, maybe potentially timeless, um, both in these, these fluted forms as well as that wedding base up, up on, on the top. Okay, thank you. Um, so this speaks perfectly of what I just said about classic forms and using these as a point of reference. I try to do this throughout my career where I continue referencing this or continue to make um, additional renditions um, of these kind of fluted forms. Um, whether it's I change some of these uh, stylistic designs of a necklace, which is said to give a pot life. Um, it is not completely closed. There is always an opening to allow that pot to ble breathe. Um, and so these are some examples of um, in ways I've attempted to do that. Um, um, sorry. Yes. For those people who don't know what the necklace is, can you maybe point to it with your mouse or something? Yeah. So on this one in particular, this necklace that is this raised coil work that is decorated um, near the rim of the pot or the mouth or the lip of the pot. Um, that is the necklace that I'm referring to. Um, and on these others too, I have these um, raised points um, going through. They are equally distanced. Um, I don't know if they're, it's pictured, but there is one missing in that pattern on both of them to signify that opening. Um, part two. Um, of my artist statement with challenging strict boundaries of juried shows. This is an adjusted quote um, to, for the context of traditional pottery that I kind of pieced together from my class with Kirsten Buick. The vocabulary used to describe traditional pottery do a better job at persuading authenticity rather than describing something that is real. Um, and this is glaring when the definition of tradition changes drastically based on who you ask that question to. If when we ask to the jury standards um, what tradition is, there is a clear checklist. If we ask other artists what tradition is, it's quite possible you get a different answer um, from different people. Um, and what my hope is, is we have tradition that is something rather than extracted uh, ways to describe methodology, I hope that it is more defined and rooted closer to something of culture and community. Um, so knowing this and what markets define or juried shows define as traditional, it is inherently market driven. This is another quote from Eating the Landscape. Um, eating a landscape is more than just acting, the act of eating and Dana Shiva suggests that eating is a political act through our choices to eat locally or to eat food that has traveled 2000 miles to reach our grocery shelves, um, we support a process. Eating is not only a political act, but it is also a cultural act that reaffirms one's identity and worldview each time one sits down for a plate of home-cooked beans or sopa de um, albondigas. Culture is performed by humans every minute of every day. Eating our culture and fam familiar memories is another ritual that is performed throughout our lives. Um, so when we have these categories, um, I think uh, subconsciously or un, um, intentionally, we limit what is created. Um, and that is um, market driven and it is inherently po political. Um, as one response I do to that is I like to include function or reference function in my work, whether it's literally by making rocket kettles, which I've only made one and would love to revisit this, or how I document my work um, with connection to water, um, or having more, I have a, a mug wait list that I make mugs, so you, there's a more intimate relationship to the work I make, um, something that is, so that it has a life beyond mine, 
um, involvement of hands, involvement of food, um, and things like that. Um, speaking of function, one thing I've dived head first into is corrugation. It is well known mostly to be implemented from 650 AD to 1450 AD, um, and it was an engineering feat. Um, each of these coils or these lines, these rows, are layered almost like shingles. So it is layered below or underneath the row of corrugation above it, sometimes three, maybe five rows deep. Um, the engineering advantage to this is when you have a smooth interior and a textured out exterior, you increase the surface area and it conducts heat better. It is allowed to flex better with the heating and cooling cycle that happens naturally with cooking. So it is less likely to crack. Um, this is extremely time consuming and um, something that I have started to fall in love with in terms of process. Um, this is um, a, an example from my thesis show of the potential use of these vessels. Um, I worked together with a weaver named Kevin Uspas to um, do an indigo dye, um, to dye some wool out of one of these vessels. One of the goals was that I wanted the dye process to change the pot. Um, to show that this pot has lived, is living a life um, beyond my hands. Um, and ultimately, this is the hope for the connection as art, as engineering. It challenges the lines of folk art versus folk art, um, of fine art and craft, where, and oftentimes fine art is static, um, it is not used, and folk art or craft is something that is very functional. Um, so I asked the question, is this something that would be considered craft, or would it be fine art? Um, if we separate the two and I made the vessel alone, it could easily be considered fine art. The wool will eventually be woven into a beautiful tapestry that would easily be considered fine art. But together, this overlap, um, where will it be classified? I um, have a question and, about this. Um, what yes. changes, if any, what, what changes did you notice happen to the pot? Yes, so clay is, okay, so it naturally changed the color. The interaction with the fire, um, whether it's clay, change the fire clouds. Usually you bury it in coals. Um, so underneath you have this oxidation section below. Um, I fell in love with this because there's an era of Navajo pottery referred to as Dineta Gray that is, has this smoky gray look to it um, and uh, often really textured on the outside, not typically corrugation, but usually scraped with a um, corn cob, leaving out that rough texture to increase surface area. Um, and that's how we, and then the dye on the inside and any splashes on the outside of the pot um, change, the, change the markings of the surface. We also notice that the clay is more alkaline, so it completely changes the chemistry of the dye. So it is a, uh, um, a current- So Kevin got a new, a new color out of this process. Oh, uh, it just like, it changed the process of how the wool grabbed the, the mm -hmm. dye if yeah. that makes sense. And we first did a lichen dye on this side um, and that we were, it wasn't, the wool didn't really grab the dye at all. Um, so it is a potential area of research um, to um, potentially quantify this kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, this is the perfect slide to kind of what does this equation give us? This indigo dye plus wool plus special, what's it kind of leading to in this overlap of disciplines? Um, which brings me to the piece that was in this exhibition um, that I have used a technique self-titled as multi-directional corrugation. It is different than what you um, 
would consider classic corrugation. Um, it is currently a trade secret of mine on how I do it. So you can see the rows of corrugation going different directions, overlapping, um, potentially um, having to, to weave them together almost. It is very challenging and the more I do it, I have to learn how to uh, plan ahead and how do I bring this all together. Um, but one important thing is there's obviously a pattern on it. It's obviously decorated but it is not carved and not incised. And so up to this point in jury shows, there has not been a clear category for it. Um, so it kind of floats around. Um, and because of that, it has these strong roots in tradition of corrugation. It's traditional clay, it's pit fired. Um, and the market that's defining these categories does not have a home for it, um, implies a flaw that I hope to address. Um, which ultimately um, my part three is addressing the time aspect. In my work, there's, ob there's references to time, but I want to use those techniques that are something that is very present to me. Um, that is an embodiment of the thoughts that are going in my life, the events that are going in my life, maybe my feelings, um, being aware of those, being aware of the weather, how they change, that weather that day changes the firing and changes the colors. Um, and um, traditional standards have a huge time element because it emphasizes techniques from a time of our most, of, of a time period where we were considered most authentic. Um, so the last part of my Artist statement is to our fault, we tend to soften the memories of our past with romance rather than fall in love with our present. We look upon the past with a lot of nostalgia and because of that, it's very hard to be honest with it. And if we can't be honest with our past, it is incredibly hard to be honest with our present. Um, and I hope my work leaves a lingering taste of that reminiscent, that is reminiscent of that fleeting moment um, I want my pots to be a timestamp of when I made it in my life. Once it's fired, it's set. It's not changing. Um, I also intend it to carry the weight of all these events that are happening at the same time. So the events of my transitionship in fatherhood, the events of what I contemplated in my uh, pursuit of an MFA, the events that have been told and retold through family memory of storytelling and landscape. And lastly, I dream of pots that tell a story of land while also escaping the vernacular that limits its realness. Ultimately, I want to make work that is honest with who I am and is liberated from the limits that um, our definitions uh, bind it to, if that makes sense. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, if there are any questions or if there's anything that needs to be um, clarified, um, please let me know. Well, thank you so much, Jared. I really enjoyed listening to your talk. I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your willingness to share all of this knowledge. I think you, you, you um, gave us so much to think about from so many different angles, academic angle, the artist angle, um, you know, just you describing and being truthful with trying to figure out, you know, um, mm -hmm. trying to trying to redefine terms and um, yeah, terminologies that 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 need to be updated in order for, um, you know, them to be workable for everyone. Um, I Um, yeah, I don't have any, any questions. I think I did have some, I was writing some down as I was going and then you, you answered them. So I don't have any questions personally. There was something that I saw come in, um, in the question box, uh, from Stash Jiraki and it disappeared. It says, oh, are most of your pots on the larger size? They, they vary. 
Um, I recently have been wanting to go large as a challenge for myself um, because building it isn't the challenge. Like it's a, more of a time consuming and polishing is a lot more work. But um, I would say the last two years I've really been experimenting with my firing, mm -hmm. uh, both in colors and different kind of using different woods or, or fuel for that and how firing something large is a uh, challenging task. So kind of putting myself in that scenario to, to see what I can can do for myself. As you were experimenting with the corrugation, um, you know, creating these asymmetric lines in your corrugation work, does that impact? Um, does, is it harder to make, you know, larger pots with that technique compared to like the normal corrugation or how does that impact, um, you know, the pot? Yeah, so the when you the time commitment the larger i go the time increases exponentially um, especially the more time i spend with corrugation i i've started to bind my coils tighter and tighter just because of what that does to visually to the pot it's a lot more satisfying but it, it takes a lot more time um so you know it's it's nice to sit down and be really patient with the small version of it but when you go larger it's um, you have a lot more surface area to express that design or explore it mm -hmm. um, we did have a couple more questions come in um, thank you for for that answer someone is asking oh Ann Steiner says how has becoming a father changed your work um I think it's 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 forced me to like first look at my own relationship with my own father and then kind of using that to think of my own relationship with my daughter what I want to model um how do I want to model a work life balance when I'm an artist that has a studio at his home um times to invite her into that space um and encourage that exploration of clay without pressure. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a bit liberating because it's a little easier to encourage her creatively when I have to be creative and um, in contrast to like working previously as an engineer. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter Liebsman is asking, what is the most challenging part of creating your pots? When they crack in the <laughs> firing, because you grieve and um, like the discouragement that can happen with that and still having to attempt it again. Mm -hmm. um, that is, that's the, probably the most challenging. How often does that happen? It depends, honestly, on the clay that I get. Um, maybe if maybe 30%, 40% of my work in the recent years, but that is also a, like an, a result of my experimentation with firing. Um, that inherently implies a risk. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Jonathan Painter asks, how do your masks and helmets fit into your art versus the pots? Um, so that is a connection with eight-year-old Jared when I got obsessed with Lord of the Rings. This is in a reference to a show that was in December called um, um, History Became Legend, Became History Became Legend, Legend Became Myth. And it is a reference to this landscape painting. Um, and this east to west motion is mimicked in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings with the movement of Mordor from east to west. Um, and ultimately how Tolkien uses these themes of maps of um, good versus evil, of the expansion, the themes to have create world building and how the paintings of landscape also participate in world building. Um, I, collaborated on the artist talk with my sister 
who is a cartographer. So she helped challenge and expand our perspective of maps in that talk, that it's not just limited to 2D paintings. So um, the helmets are um, each have an individual story that is grounded in this landscape, storyteller, world building um, theme. Mm. Let's see. Um, Peter Liebsman again is asking, do you plan all of your pots before you create them or do you allow the creative moment to take over the process? Um, so it's, it's a balance. There has to be some plan, um, but kind of my process is if I have an idea for a show or a batch of pots, I'll have an idea for the first maybe two or three, and then maybe on pot four, that's when I get the spark, oh, I should do this or have a new idea. And that's when the creative process um, sparks something new for me. And if I don't participate in that, then um, I'm left scratching my head. Um, you can get inside your head a little bit too much. And so it's, I don't know, you have to plan to be able to start the process and allow the process to take you somewhere. So it's like, a, it's a blend. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and then I have another question. Do you prefer traditional clay or commercial clay? It depends on the purpose. Um, I, I got to, I was a visiting artist at the Archie Bray, Archie Bray in Helena, Montana, and I used a lot of commercial clay there. Um, I made, I finally made a set of dishes for myself. So I used commercial clay for that. Mm -hmm. But in like what I gravitate for creatively, I always prefer traditional clay, um, each spot you get clay as a different character and um, has a, just has some qualities that are different than commercial clay. Um, and after spending a lot of time with traditional clay, um, I've been trying to find the best word for how to describe commercial clay. And it has this silly putty, like rubberiness to it. That is hard for me. Um, let's see if we have time for, okay, we have more time. Um, if a piece breaks in firing, do you find creative ways to grow into saving a new piece or a new way to create? Um, in the past, yes. Um, out of, some of it was out of necessity for the time in my life. Um, now, not so much anymore. Um, as I start to fine tune some concepts, I am trying to be the have or be the biggest proponent for quality control for myself. So when something goes wrong, then um, just move on. Mm -hmm. And so let's see, I think we just have one more. Um, and you can answer. So this one, I found it fascinating that your comment about nostalgia making it hard to see the present, honestly is a comment about the current tensions in our wider culture. So I guess that was more a comment than a question. I should have read that before I said it. Um, so for example, racism, anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, so if you wanted to respond to that, you may. If not, um, I think I've covered all the questions in our, from our audience. Yeah, I, I think there's some truth to that, that last comment. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much again. Um, for those of you who were not able to see Arriving Forever to, into the present world, again, I apologize. Um, it was such a joy to have you here speaking to us, Jared. Um, and um, we really um, felt honored, number one, to have your pot in our collection, and then also um, to have it available for um, showing in in the exhibition. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you maybe in March. Will you be at the Herd Museum Market in March? That's the plan. That's the inventory I'm currently working on. So I'm excited to uh, to show okay. that. Usually I don't do any sneak peeks until the show and then I'll post on social media, but I'm looking oh. forward to that. Oh, wonderful. So we will see Jared in March, everybody. And before closing up, thank you so much, Velma, for your moderation and Jared for your presentation. Um, we do have 
a little bit more time before the one o'clock uh, gets around here. I did see two more questions after the last comment that was posted. If you're if you're open to answering those questions, and then just a friendly reminder, we do send a post survey out after the virtual art talks for the attendees. If you can let us know um, your thoughts on today's presentation and virtual art talks in general, that would be so wonderful to hear back from you who are attending. Um, uh, Jared, are you open to two more questions from the audience? Um, could you repeat that last bit? Sorry. Wondering if we have time to follow up with the two questions from the uh, from the audience uh, about definitely. your process. So, um, Velma, would you would you like to um, to lead that, or should I ask? Since I missed the questions, um, I think you should ask them. I don't see them. I don't mind. So Jonathan Painter was able to um, submit a question. How do your masks and helmets fit into your art versus pots? Um, I think I I think this was one of the questions we did answer. Oh, it was. I'm so sorry. Yeah. We saw them at yeah. the end, and I wasn't sure if we caught that. Yeah. And okay. then traditional versus commercial clay. That okay. one, we got that one as well. Beautiful. Then that was my um, my mistake. No worries. Yeah, and one one last thing I want to say, just in terms of food for thought on how to approach this, because um, I've done a lot of criticism, but have not suggested a clear alternative to definitions for category or how to structure jury shows. I I was um, going to ask you if you had any any um, suggestions, but uh, I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm, you're. I'm, I'm cautious too, because I don't want to be the voice for everyone. Um, so I think it's important to have the dialogue. And when we talk about using the word traditional or contem contemporary, that we take the time to elaborate um, and kind of see where that discussion collectively adjusts. I know every year in jury shows, there's pots that challenge these concepts so every year there's an attempt to to um oh, that one. to address it and i think that process will lead somewhere as long as we're all proactive in having that discussion yeah definitely i think um you know having these discussions more frequently might be one way to to get closer to um, something that works for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it's a very complicated, you know, um, process to, 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 to define categories when artists are continually, you know, being innovative, you know. Um, but yes, I think our time is up. And again, we'd like to extend our appreciation to you, Jared. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you all for um, being here for our artist talk, and um, we will see you next time.